Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy. On Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Welcome to Inspired Conversations. I'm your host, Inspirista, Mindset Mojo Mentor, and Sacred Visibility Catalyst, Linda Joy, publisher of Aspire Magazine, the premier inspirational magazine for women since 2006. You know, I love bringing you intimate conversation with today's leading visionary woman in the fields of personal and spiritual development, success and mindset, health and wellness, self-empowerment, and more. If topics like that speak to your soul and you're ready to dive a little deeper into those topics, I invite you to join InspiredLivingUniversity.com, a sacred curriculum and community for women where our expert faculty brings you the masterclasses, weekly live coaching calls, and so much more to support you in mastering the art of living. And for a limited time, we're offering three pay-what-you-can options to support you on this journey called life. I look forward to seeing you on campus, my beautiful friend. So today we're going to be talking with Heather Grish, and we're going to be talking about Ayurveda, as well as fertility, because creating new life is a natural part of being a woman, but for many women, it doesn't always come as easily as expected. With high stress modern lives, women, many women's bodies are not prepared to nurture the growth of a child, and they may even find it challenging to become pregnant. Heather discovered firsthand that the practice of Ayurveda and its deep teachings on the four fertility factors could help her and other women create the optimal conditions for conception. So she joins me today to share that understanding, which I'm excited to say led to the birth of her son. Heather is the author of the Ayurvedic Guide to Fertility. A board certified Ayurvedic practitioner, she bridges the worlds of conventional and alternative medicine to help women and men heal their physical and emotional lives. Heather is on the board of directors for the National Ayurvedic Medical Association and has consulted with doctors, governments, and insurance companies. Welcome, Heather. Hi, Linda. I am so glad to have you here, and I'll be sharing your sacred wisdom in an upcoming issue of Aspire magazine. I think this is such an important topic to let women know um, that there's other possibilities. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited about that. And I'm I'm picking up, I love the way you said my name because are you are you from the East Coast or like New England? <laughs> yes, because Boston. I, me too. I grew up in Rhode Island. So uh, you said my name so similarly to how people said it when I grew up. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> well, I'm glad I made you feel at home. Yeah. So tell me, what led you on this path, was you already interested in Ayurvedic um, medicines and practices before your own struggle, or you, did your struggle lead you to this? Oh my gosh, I would say uh, <laughs> my whole my whole life's probably been some many different sorts of struggles. So I would say probably the struggles came first. Um, yeah, I guess I, you know, I didn't really ever feel like I was super unhealthy, to be honest growing up. Um, I, you know, I smoked when I was in my twenties and drank in college and all that stuff. Um, but you know, I never had what a lot of people actually come to Ayurveda because they have like gut issues or skin issues or, um, you know, some kind of health condition that is very external, you know, that they want to, um, work on like a weight issue or their energy just doesn't feel good. There's so many different reasons that people have come to Ayurveda, chronic conditions, things like that. But I didn't really realize that 
I had anything going on with me because um, I was on the pill for so many years. Um, and for me, my I would say kind of my my biggest health issue uh, was not having regular menstrual cycles. And I didn't really know that that was going on for many years because I was on the pill, like many women for so many years. And it wasn't really until I got off of the pill where I was like, oh yeah, I remember before I went on the pill, this probably wasn't working so well. I was kind of like, what's going on with my periods? But then you go on the pill and everything sort of gets masked. Uh, and, and so when I was in my 30s, I, I actually found Ayurveda because I was teaching yoga and I just, you know, I got to yoga through, you know, really just wanting to have less stress in my life. And I was really into exercising and I just loved how yoga made my body feel. Uh, then I really got into meditation, but through that process of studying yoga and then teaching yoga and then teaching yoga teachers, I had discovered Ayurveda essentially through that work. And I was about 32 when I first found Ayurveda. And it's funny because I, my parents still can't pronounce it. <laughs> it's kind of a hard word to say for Americans. And when I first heard about it though, and I was taught about the elements, basically the five elements from Ayurveda, which is kind of similar to similar to Chinese medicine in that we have a very basic elemental system rather than like the periodic table of elements that we're using, um, like modern science uses. But I found these elements, just learning about them just immediately tapped me into my intuition that I felt something was sort of missing before learning this actually, or something had been sort of dormant for a long time. And from so from that first moment that I found Ayurveda, I knew that there was something really big that I was going to learn from it. And uh, I ended up going really super deep into it, getting a master's degree, leaving my corporate job that I was in for a long time, and uh, going and get a master's degree in Ayurveda and kind of just re, I kind of redid my whole life in some way. And my health in that process just was amazing. Uh, all the things that I was learning and practicing and the healers that I was working with on my path, I just started to feel better and better and healthier and healthier. And my, you know, by the time I got into my mid thirties, I hadn't had kids and I was, uh, you know, concerned about that. <laughs> like many women, once they hit 35, I was like, oh man, I waited a long time. Is it going to happen? And should I do it? And I, I didn't have the partner yet that I thought was going to be good for that. And that was really stressful. But what I also noticed was that I was having issues with my menstrual cycles. They were off. They were weird. They weren't regular. There was, you know, a, a problem there that I had to look at. So I did heal that with my Ayurvedic practitioner. Uh, and so in addition to learning how to help other people, I certainly helped myself through studying that. Well, son, what I love too is hearing how intuitive it felt to you, like it was an inner knowing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think everybody finds maybe something different or a different tool that helps them do that in their life because somehow society um, is, I don't know, somehow we lose that in society, whether it's because of how easily conditioned we are, uh, by our environment, you know, there's that sort of living from the outside in or living from the inside out. And certainly Ayurveda helped me learn more from the inside, helped me learn how to live more from the inside out, and uh, really on a, a physical level, but also on a mental and an emotional level as well. That really speaks to me because I remember when I started Aspire Magazine 14 years ago, you know, I didn't have any publishing or marketing experience. I just had this deep desire and it kept coming to me in a dream. And what I kept hearing was there's no magazine out there that speaks to me to the essence of who I am as a woman. And the, the core message, especially 14 years ago when it's evolved, was 
I want to create a magazine that helps women live from the inside out. Mm. You know, and so you'll, the language you're choosing to use right now really speaks to me because we forget that, right? We've been co- disconnected from it. And it's, it's like the remembering of the truth of what we know is within us. We just have to tap back into it. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I was surprised on my own journey, actually, how scary that was to learn how to trust myself you know, even as I got, even as I felt more sense of empowerment, I remember just feeling, you know, like I was floating out in space at some point and I wasn't being sort of my, I had complete agency at a certain point. You know, I I didn't have a a boss I had to report to. I didn't have, uh, you know, any person in my life I was trying to please or all the things that that we do there and and I remember feeling like I remember I was I asked one of my yoga teachers I was like you need to give me a project because I don't know I don't know how to I don't know how to just be (laughs) oh that was a big one for me too so I can really relate on that yeah and then somehow I got that was like this last step for me after that, I realized I was like, why am I asking her for a project? That is so weird. And, uh, you know, after that, I, I just, uh, you know, it really shifted for me. And also, you know, I think I personally, uh, knowing my sort of temperament, I'm not kind of like a, a hustler kind of go getter. I mean, I'm a go getter in that I work hard, but I, I'm, I'm not very um, entrepreneurial, I would say, in my demeanor, in my temperament, naturally. And so I've had to do a lot of kind of trainings that in order to be able to um, live in a way where I can be more independent, I've had to do a lot of entrepreneurial and like business coaching trainings as well. So that's another thing that helped me in addition to Ayurveda, to be able to uh, run my own business. Well, and think of it this way, it's um, to spread your message, your mission. We have to learn those things, right? I had to do the same. And Heather, we're going to take our first break. And when we come back, why don't we give a, a brief overview of what Ayurveda is for those listening and who may be new to it. So we'll be back in a moment. I'm with Heather Grish of heathergrish.com. And I want to spell her last name. It is G-R-Z-Y-C-H.com, heathergrish.com. And we'll be back in a moment. A conscious lifestyle for a mindful life. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Inspiration for a woman's soul. Aspire Magazine. Inspiring and supporting women on the path of self-discovery. Claim your free digital subscription today, which includes access to thousands of dollars of personal development bonus gifts from Team Inspiration Partners. Claim your Aspire Magazine subscription today at subscribetoaspire.com. Hey America, we need to have a little talk. We've got more food than we know what to do with in this country, yet 17 million kids in America are struggling with hunger. Makes no sense. Luckily, the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks has volunteers gathering excess food and getting it to hungry kids. They're kind of like food angels. Hey, become a food angel yourself by supporting Feeding America in your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. We can't do it without your help. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Are you trying to get from point A to point B and need a little advice? Connect with the counselors at Om Times Advisors. Whether you're looking for a life coach or a spiritual intuitive, the advisors participating at advisors.omtimes.com were carefully chosen based on their gifts, skills, and professionalism. Om Times Advisors, connecting you with the best advisors in the business. Hi everyone, this is Shay Parker, the host of Best of the Best, which airs live right here on IOM Radio every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm super excited to bring you expert guest hosts, spiritual discussions, free psychic readings, and so much more. I can promise that you will not want to miss this one-of-a-kind, fun, yet touching, down-to-earth show. Join us every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Pacific on OTRFM. This is Shay Parker, and I can't wait to see you there. 
This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Welcome back. You're listening to Inspired Conversations. I'm your host, Linda Joy, and with me today is Heather Grish. And we're talking about Ayurveda, fertility, and her journey of healing, becoming a practitioner, and writing her book, The Ayurvedic Guide to Fertility. So for the listeners who may be really new to it, what's the simplistic definition to help them understand what Ayurveda is? So Ayurveda is a system of self-care and holistic health and healing that comes from India. And it's very old (laughs) in its background, thousands of years old. And it's been, it's practiced very widely in India. There are about 400,000 people who practice uh, as Ayurvedic doctors in India to help people heal. And we have started to spread this in the United States in the last few decades. And it deals with a lot of the things that are being neglected in our current healthcare system. The emotional and spiritual impacts of health, I think, are being uh, addressed with this kind of medicine. And so we look at mind, body, and spirit. And I know that's really easy to say, and I feel like every sort of banner or poster I see on the, as I'm driving on the road, you know, big billboards for even hospital systems and health companies are all talking about, let's treat the whole person. Let's get to the root cause, let's treat mind, body, and spirit. And I actually feel like Ayurveda is doing this. (laughs) And basically because you have to look at yourself with Ayurveda. Yes, we use herbs for medicine. Um, It's, you know, that's always how it was done. You had herbs that grew near where you lived and those were used as medicines. And so, yes, we still do that today. We still use a lot of herbal medicine, but the power of observation of your own physiology, your own emotional state, the things that are coming in your body and the things that are coming out of your body, we really help people observe this now and get closer to the root causes of disease. So I like to say that Ayurveda is, and I know this is so wonderful because so many people are gardening now um, with the pandemic. That's been one of the really beautiful things that I've seen come out of it. And I feel like Ayurveda is like learning how to garden because you are the plant in this case. And like all plants, you have to figure out what kind of environment do they do well in? How much water do they need? Uh, How much sun do they need? Do they need extra fertilizer? What kind of soil do they need to grow in? Should it be thick, dense soil? Should it be soil that has a lot of air in it so that the roots don't feel so congested um, when they try to grow? How big of a pot should it be in? So Like you do that with a plant, you have to do the same thing with yourself and start to observe, what do I need to be healthy? Like truly, what do I need? And how am I different than other people? Because I know my body is different and I know that my life experience is different and my uh, my wounds of my past are different. The way that I need to heal is different. So I love using this gardening reference because it's such a an intuitive way of understanding that we all have to pay attention to our individual bodies in the environments where they are in order to be healthy. And that might mean uh, somebody does well when they eat eggplant. You know, I know that gets a bad rap in, you know, conventional uh, medicine in modern biology, everybody talks about that, the the nightshades being bad for everybody, but they're not bad for everybody. They're bad for certain 
bodies. <laughs> They're really good for other bodies and learning what is beneficial for your body and what is harmful for your body is what Ayurveda allows you to do. So eggplant as an example, or um, how much sleep a person needs uh, could differ slightly or uh, how much, what kind of temperatures people benefit by being in. Uh, so the, all of the sensory effects, whether it's the sense of touch and the taste in the food that you eat or the smells or the sounds that you hear or the things that you look at, they're all going to affect you very differently. And so it's a sensory study to find really what is most beneficial for your body. I love it. It's so it's like each one of us is programmed with our own blueprint. And it's really understanding that blueprint and making decisions from that place. So it's really studying what, how your body responds to different things to figure out what your blueprint is. Absolutely. And it happens on a multidimensional level with Ayurveda because we obviously are, you know, very closely aligned with yoga. So, and a lot of people who do yoga are into Ayurveda and or meditation because Ayurveda really does require more self-awareness and Ayurveda and yoga and meditation. These are tools of having self-awareness and self-realization. So it's really difficult to study yourself if you're, if you can't pay attention to yourself, but once you can pay attention to yourself and you can, you know, withdraw your senses more into yourself and perceive what's going on on the inside, then you can do this work. So beautiful. It's so, um, I don't know. I, it feels like organic. Like it's the way it should be. Yeah, it totally. And I, I do feel like, you know, it's funny. I, I always laugh and I tell people, yeah, I had to go to a master's, go get a master's degree in something that was so basic that I knew probably when I was young and forgot this sort of observation, the direct perception piece of, oh, I did this. This is what it did to my body. And mm, that was good. That was beneficial. That was harmful. Or, and then I did this. I, I did this action and this was the effect of it, you know, being able to see that super clearly, but you know, humans now our minds are so busy. I don't know why that is now. I don't know the origin of that, but our minds are so busy all the time as any meditator can tell you that the process of being able to transcend those busy thoughts and not get distracted even by those thoughts. Because there's so many things you can get distracted by in your life. You can get distracted by the world, what's going on outside you and what your senses are perceiving. You can get distracted by how your body feels if you have pain or you know, a health thing going on. Or you can also get distracted by your thoughts and what's going on in your mind. And I think what Ayurveda does, it sort of helps you go through all of those layers to um, reconnect with your direct perception. It's a beautiful way of describing it. And I agree, I think for so many, and I can just speak from my experience that we get into that mode where we're so disconnected from our body. And, and it could be from childhood issues, whatever it may be, but for so long, I was disconnected from my body that I used to feel like I was my, from just the head up. So of course I wasn't noticing the things that were happening in my body because I wasn't slowing down enough to listen. I was like, I was, you know, a hundred miles an hour. Um, have you heard that described too? Like that feeling of disconnect? Absolutely. It's really common. And, you know, living from the head up, that's one thing. Uh, you know, other people feeling like their feet are not on the ground. People feeling, some people actually feel like they're out side of their body so their awareness is more outside of their body and they they can't like so the whole body feels disconnected and obviously there would have to be a pretty big level of trauma to um or or energetic imbalance to have that happen to a person so we you know that's a sensitivity that we all have to consider 
when we're going through a healing process and uh, trying to be very delicate with the things that have happened to us in our lives that have caused us to lose that connection with our bodies and to try to trust that it's okay to come back in. It's okay to feel the whole body. Uh, and that happens, we don't feel it, you know, for many reasons, but one of the, one of the things that we really um, focus on in Ayurveda is balancing the doshas, which I can talk about if you want, but also making sure that there are no blockages in the body and that, you know, you could think about that from an energetic perspective, you know, that energy being blocked, for example, but there's also a physical manifestation of blocking in a body. You know, anytime you have a growth of some sort, there's a blockage of something, you know, there's a information or nutrients or water or blood being sort of obstructed. Anytime you have an obstruction, a physical obstruction, anytime a channel is inflamed, but also when there's a, uh, like a plaque inside of a body where we know we get plaque on our teeth, but we also know that we can get plaque in our heart we can get plaque in our brain and we can get plaques all over our body. So a lot of people feel disconnected because there's some clutter inside as well. And so if we want to connect with our soul, with our spirit, we really need to make sure that the body is open for that and that the body is um, resilient, but also that all the channels are clear. And when I say channels, I'm not, you know, there's a, I can, I could go woo woo with that too, but it's like, I really mean, you know, your arteries are clear and your digestive tract. These are channels, physical channels in the body. And so we spend a lot of time kind of helping people optimize that so that they can really feel the whole life that they have. Which is so important. And I would love to dive in. We're going to take another break. When we come back, I want to talk about those fears, blockages and conflict that someone might be holding on to that's actually maybe preventing them from holding a child, like how it's all connected. So Heather, when we come back, let's talk about that. And I'll be back in a moment with Heather Grish of heathergrish.com. That's G-R-Z-Y-C-H.com. We'll be back in a moment. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. Are you feeling a deep, persistent ache in your soul, telling you there is so much more you could be experiencing? Are you tired of your life quietly being shaped by fear and doubt instead of by your dreams? Inspirational speaker, certified law of attraction coach, and best-selling author Kelly Michelle empowers heart-centered women in their 40s and 50s to boldly reimagine and recreate their next phase of life in alignment with who they are now. Through her deeply transformational coaching, programs, and writing, Kelly emboldens, inspires, and guides women like you to embrace your inner truth. This is your invitation to discover new, incredible opportunities available to you in this profound and powerful time in your life. Visit YourDreamsYourLife.com to learn more about Kelly's supportive and transformational programs and to schedule your complimentary Clarity Breakthrough Session. Me, a cat, moving in with a new human. It took a little getting used to. She has these weird games she likes to play, like this giant feather. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. She sticks it in my face. I swat it away. It's almost like she thinks I enjoy it. But seeing how much fun she gets out of it, well, I guess it makes it all worth it. Humans. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Welcome back. You're listening to Inspired Conversations. I'm your host, Linda Joy. And with me today is Heather Grish, author of The Ayurvedic Guide to Fertility. So right before the break, Heather, you were talking about blockages, you know, in our systems, physical systems. I also believe, like you, about the energetic systems. And because you work with and write about fertility, what are some of the fears, blockages, or conflicts that 
a woman might be holding within them that's actually pre maybe preventing them from actually holding a child. Yeah, I would say that they're, they can happen either on a mental level or a physical level or an energetic level and oftentimes on multiple levels. And they're, you know, if you look at why, if, if a woman were to get pregnant um, and not want to have that baby, for example, um, like a woman who went to have an abortion, why are people, why do people get abortions? Uh, and there's lots of different reasons for that, but you will start to see that there's fear and that's a huge thing for people that oftentimes there's a sense that the environment or the life is not right for it. Um, she's not old enough or she's too old. <laughs> uh, the timing issue uh, that I have something I want to do, you know, career focus. I like to travel, you know, this, this sort of focusing on some other big desire besides, you know, starting a family, putting your energy into something big, whether it's your job or, you know, some passion that you have, or there isn't enough money. That's a big one in our culture. You know, this is some of the mental stuff that goes on for people now where he's the wrong guy, you know, he's not the right guy. Now the money piece is interesting because a lot of times I ask women when I first start to work with them, I say, okay, tell me what your, your unique vision of motherhood looks like. If you could sort of design it exactly how you wanted it. What is, what does that picture look like for you? And there'll be a pause and then the answer will come. If money isn't an issue, and I've always, you know, and this will even come from someone who's got like an insanely good job who makes a lot of money. It's not even, you know, always coming from somebody who doesn't have <laughs> any money. It's oftentimes coming from people who have a lot of money that I hear that. And so there, there's certainly the mind chatter that goes on and there's this maybe, oh, my life isn't how I want it to be. Now, the mind piece is tricky because say women now have it really different than our mothers did or our grandmothers did. We have an amazing uh, array of careers that we can have. We have so many options available to us that perhaps previous generations didn't have. And so, you know, we can work, we can stay home. We have lots of different choices that we can make, but a lot of women now, I think like 70 something percent of mothers are working mothers. So most women that have children continue to work and that may have not been the case for their mothers. So sometimes there's also like, I don't know how I would do it. That's not what my mom did. I mean, I can relate to that because my mom worked when I was older, but not when I was really, not when I was young. I don't think she worked till I was about, I mean, she worked part-time, but she didn't work full-time until I was say 12 or so. So I even remember that. And, uh, but some women get really hung up on that because they just, they're, they're used to living from a place of having modeling done for them and they don't have a model to follow in that case. And it can get, it can feel really scary for them to, to do it a different way. They just can't see how it would be done. Uh, so those are some of the, I would say, uh, psychological factors, kind of like the mental piece and then there are, well, there's also like, I could be afraid of dying. <laughs> That's a huge thing because birth is a big, wild, amazing, scary experience to go through when you have a baby. So I think some women really do have a, a deep fear of that. And so all uh, these things um, are layers that could prevent them from getting pregnant, even though that a lot of them might be unconscious. You know, it's interesting. So yesterday I had a client who uh, was talking about, you know, I said, you know, she says, like, I set up an appointment with you because I want to explore my fertility. And yet I know I'm not with the right guy. Um, and 
I don't feel safe with him. Wow. And I, yeah. And this is like someone she's been in a relationship with for a really long time. And I was really struck by that because it was like, well, why do we make choices that are not beneficial to us? Like bottom, you know, that's like one question. But then the other thing that comes up is that we have competing desires oftentimes. So I want this and I want this and they don't mix (laughs) or we haven't figured out how to make them mix together. We view them as sort of like opposing forces within us and they have to be worked out. So that will cause like a a teetering or or a waffling kind of effect for a lot of people. Um, So, but you know, that's, so the mind definitely, you know, that, that will affect whether or not she takes the birth control pill, for example, you know, she was still on this particular woman was still on the birth control pill. So certainly the mind affects the choices that we make. And then that affects the physiology um, and the options that are available. But also if you want to talk about say like a woman who has made the decision to have a child, like I want a kid, she says, I want a kid. And she and her partner start trying and it's not working. That's, you know, why would that be happening? And fertility is kind of mysterious. There's, you know, certain aspects of it that are pretty clear. We know that the woman's body needs to be in good condition and that her reproductive material, her eggs, et cetera, need to be in good condition. Her uterus needs to be in good condition, her ovaries, her vaginal canal, her cervix, all of those physical parts. And the man needs to be healthy. And, you know, his little sperms need to swim and needs to have enough of them. And they need to have good fluids to to bathe in. So they have enough energy to get their job done. And, you know, same sort of physical sort of structural considerations as well as a woman making sure there's not inflammation going on or uh, blockages or plaques or tumors or anything like that that could be blocking something. So that can happen on a physical level. And the the tricky thing about the physical body is that it is affected by the choices that we make and also by the environment around us. And so the the way that your body is created, the way that your tissues get created is a convergence of what you've done and what is going on outside of you and also what sort of your mom and your grandma did or you know before uh, you got your body. Um, so there's this convergence that happens and all of those will add up to a situation that is healthy and receptive or uh, blocked in some way. It amazes me how much everything just comes together and you say in, in the book that preparing your body for conception is not that different from planting the garden. So let's talk about that, that, um, you know, that uh, comparison again in how you see the two of them. Yeah, I love this. You know, there's, I wrote about in my book, um, this concept that comes from the ancient Ayurvedic texts of, uh, I call it the four fertility factors but there are four components that are necessary uh, for fertility. And so one is that you need to have a seed. And so just like you plant a seed in the garden or in the ground, you have a seed inside you. If you're a woman, you have the egg. And if you're a man, you have the sperm. And so you got the seed to start. And then you the second part of this, so the second fertility factor is about the season and you need to plant them in the right season. Uh, Sort of the literal maybe interpretation of that would be uh, when the woman's ovulating or just after ovulation, that sort of opportune time to, to conceive or, but also that best time of life, right. To, um, to do that and to have your resilience and your, your stability and all those things. Uh, so there's the, the seed. This is the first one. The second one is the season. 
when you plant it. And then the third one is uh, making sure that your field is fertile. So that when you plant it in, there's like a healthy field to plant it inside so it can grow and gets all the nutrients that it needs. And like the most literal sort of way of looking at that would be the uterus, that that's the field that the, you know, that the um, embryo would be implanted into. And so you want a healthy uterus and you know what's going on with that by observing your menstrual cycles. That's the way you know there. And, uh, you know, once you get that field healthy and then you got your water, you got to water it. So that's why you have, um, water in this case represents, you know, any sort of love and attention, the ongoing love and attention that you give something, you know, so you water a seed, you literally give it water, your body's giving your seed water, water is bringing nutrients and all these other things to, you know, cause everything's carried through fluid. So those are the metaphors used uh, in the book for um, how fertility is really like gardening. And like I said earlier, everybody has different needs. So because their biology is different, even every, you know, every little embryo is different. So they all need something different too. In addition to us as people, as, you know, living out in the world and not in our mother's wombs anymore, (laughs) we all have that same uh, uniqueness that results. I just love the, how the whole analogy of how you tie that all together because just I'm writing them down. I'm like, oh my God, it makes so much sense the way you describe it. So we're going to take our final break, Heather. And then um, at the end, I'd really like to talk about a little bit more about the doshas and what they have to do with fertility. And we'll be back in a moment. We're going to take a quick break before we come back for our last segment. And I'm with Heather Grish of heathergrish.com. We'll be back in a moment. A conscious lifestyle for a mindful life. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Are you being called to step into your truth and embrace your divinity? Are you ready to align your heart and soul, live an authentic life, and become a divine magnet for love and abundance? It's time to listen to your inner wisdom and clear the blocks holding you back from your best life. Leading Intuitive Prosperity Coach, Akashic Records practitioner, and evidential medium, Jamie Hearn of LiveYourDivinity.com empowers and supports spiritual women like you to align your inner and outer worlds, embrace your soul's truth, and live your divinity. Through her intuitive gifts, grounded wisdom, and empowered coaching, Jamie guides women back into sacred alignment with their truth. Visit LiveYourDivinity.com to learn more about Jamie's empowering programs and to schedule an Akashic Record reading. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. The number one reason girls drop out of school in sub-Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Do you have time to read that inspiring book? Or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. This is OTR-FM, part of the IOM Radio Network.
Welcome back. You're listening to Inspired Conversations. Today we're talking about Ayurveda, fertility, and so much more. So Heather, um, right before the break, um, you use that beautiful, you described the four fertility factors of Ayurveda that you share in your book. And it was seed, season, fertile, and water. And Earlier in our conversation, you talked about the doshas. And in this last segment, just give us a little bit about what the doshas are so we can tie this all together. Yeah. So the word dosha means that which can go out of balance. And so maybe maybe it means a person. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we can all go out of balance. But the, it's sort of what, when we feel out of balance, it's what is out of balance. It's how we really, because a lot of people talk about stress or I don't feel balanced, but what the doshas are, are um, indicators of the way that you are imbalanced. And so examples of this are, um, there are three of them and you can have, and you can have one or more of them. And most people will have a tendency to have certain ones go out of balance more and certain ones will uh, go out of balance in different seasons as well, uh, which is why some people notice they get allergies in certain seasons, or they notice that they get, uh, you know, certain chronic conditions that rear their head in certain seasons. You know, th- this is part of why this is happening. So, the first dosha is uh, it's vata. It's called vata, and it's the air and the space elements. What that means from a an energetic manifestation is uh, that there's a lot of movement that has happened and a lot of mobility that has happened and a lot of lightness that has been created. And what happens with that is you get dry and rough and uh, there's a sense of, uh, a lot of people experience a sense of anxiety with vata because it's the least tangible of all of the um the doshas and it really connects a per it's when a person's way more connected with their their i will say maybe their non-material self <laughs> um and and feeling very ungrounded uh that's a common experience of vata and we we know that we feel these ways we don't necessarily have like some medical biomarker that we can look at to measure it but you do have an observational biomarker without you know needing to go get your blood drawn you can look at your your body and if you had high vata you would notice oh um, my skin is dry or I'm you know losing some weight I'm getting a little bit emaciated or I'm dehydrated I'm really dehydrated Uh, my pee is like really dark or I'm constipated I'm like you know, like a deer, my, my poop is like deer pellets. (laughs) That's like a common thing that Vata people experience. And what happens if you, if your body gets into this state and it can happen, Vata will manifest in different ways, depending on the tissue of your body. For example, in the skin, it would manifest as dry skin, uh, in your digestive tract, it would manifest, as I said earlier, uh, but also degenerative conditions all come from Vata. So, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, any kind of degenerative thing, a joint degeneration, uh, anything where tissues are breaking down is vata. And vata is also later stage of life. You tend to get more of this. So what we, um, that's the first category, I guess, of imbalances. And you can have too little vata as well. Most people talk about these things as having too much of them, but you could have too little vata as well. And um, that, in that case, you would probably not be feeling very energetic and because you need you need air and space elements you need movement in order to feel alive but once you get too much of it then a whole, you know you get a, you start degenerating basically from it um it's too Can much you go over the other two in a few minutes yeah sure then the other ones are the second one is pitta and that's 
I would say more correlated with inflammation in a body. And the, those are the fire and the water elements. And so when I think of pitta, I think of hot lava. So when you see women or men who have acne or red skin rashes or um, anger, lots of anger, you know, that boiling kind of intensity is pitta. And kapha is the third one. So kapha is water and earth. And you could think about kapha as um, kind of like cloudy or muddy. Uh, it builds tissues very easily. There's a sense of heaviness with it. But kapha can also start to clog things up when there's too much of it. So uh, these are the ways that we become imbalanced. And you can see that there's a physical manifestation, but there's also an energetic thing that can happen and really make us feel like we're in a different state. And when we feel like we're in a different state, that can affect our thoughts. And so everything is connected. It's so powerful. And, you know, I remember reading about this many years ago when I was going, uh, many years ago, I was a massage therapist and took some classes. And I remember um, one of the instructors talking a lot about the doshas. And I remember being just so amazed at like there was this whole way of understanding your body and now I think you've like given me a little like trigger again to say you know start looking back at that because it just feels such a natural system to me yeah it's really natural and then you start to understand well I have a tendency to have certain imbalances and I feel better in these seasons of the year. So if my body's really wet, I'm going to feel better in a dry season. If my body's really dry, I'm going to feel better in a wet season. Um, if my body's really hot, I'm going to feel better in a cold season. Or if my body's really hot, I'm going to feel better around people who feel cooling to me <laughs> or yeah. the foods, you know, cause we deal a lot with with the kinds of foods people are eating that will create these effects in the body as well. So for example, if you're just eating kale, say you just ate kale all the time, well, you're probably going to get a vata imbalance, <laughs> especially if it's raw. And if all you eat is tomatoes, well, you're probably going to get a pitta imbalance. And if all you eat is like sweets <laughs> and sugar, you're going to get a kapha imbalance. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I better look into that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my one go-to. I have to say this was such an insightful conversation. And I want to invite everyone again to visit heathergrish.com. And I want to spell her last name. So it's Heather G-R-Z-Y-C-H dot com. Learn more about a book, the Ayurvedic Guide to Fertility, and uh, visit her website for more information. You know, now more than ever. As you said, Heather, we're being invited to live from the inside out. And, you know, I invite everyone to, you know, take their first step in doing so. So thank you. Thank you, Heather, for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Linda. Oh, you're welcome. And until next time, everyone, choose love, choose joy, choose happiness, my friends. Blessings. Thanks for listening to Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy. Join our sacred space every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern and meet leading female visionaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. Inspired Conversations with Linda Joy is a soulful venue where guests share the obstacles they've overcome, along with wisdom and lessons learned on their personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic and soulful living.